It is a generally received notion that all of Shakespeare's plays are written in verse. In actual fact, only Richard II is entirely in verse. In the others, the writing shifts back and forth between verse and prose. But the shifts are all part of the journey Shakespeare's taking us on. They are clues to discovering character. You may be surprised to discover, as I was when Sis showed me, that prose also has its own very clear rhythm, though it's not always easy to immediately perceive. And then we'll be discovering and examining some dialogue to find out how characters connect through a shared vocabulary and a shared rhythm. We'll also see how the choices we make about what we're doing physically as we speak can open up yet other layers of meaning. And our final exercise in this program looks at a piece of modern text, a speech from Edward Bond's Lear, and shows how the techniques we've learned for speaking Shakespeare's language can be useful in opening up even present-day texts. Let's look at some prose, or rather hear some prose, and discover something about its rhythm. It is not a formal rhythm like the iambic beat in the verse which we have been looking at. It is much more elusive than that, but it has a rhythm and a shape nevertheless, a rhythm and a shape which often defines the meaning. Shakespeare uses long and short phrases and juxtaposes them in a way that somehow evokes a response from us as we listen. His skill at building a speech with phrases of varying lengths can produce an effect. And that effect can be comic or ironic or sad. Would I were with him wheresoever he is, either in heaven or in hell. Nay, sure he's not in hell. He's in Arthur's bosom. If ever man went to Arthur's bosom and made a finer end and went away and had been any crispin child, a parted even just between twelve and one, even at the turning of the tide, for after I saw him humble with the sheets and play with flowers and smile upon his fingers' head, <laughs> I knew there was but one way. Hmm for his nose was as sharp as a pen, and the babble of green fields. How now, Sir John, quoth I. What, man, be of good cheer. And so I cried out, God, 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 three or four times. <laughs> I took comfort him. Bid him I should not think of God. I hope there was no need to trouble himself with such thoughts yet. So I bade me lay more clothes on his feet, and I put, I put my hand into the bed, and I felt them, and they were as cold as stone. And then I fell to his knees, so upward and upward, and all was as cold as any stone. Well, the rhythm is so powerful, and like this, that's kept, it. And Not I kept. It. Cutting right. it. Don't worry, because that's yeah, exactly what Because the emotion mean. gets carried away. And yeah, I'm what did you hear from that? Just... It was terrible. Is that prose? <laughs> what? Is that prose? It's prose. It's prose. Yes. Does it have a rhythm? It does. Yeah, yes. Like and this is really important because it affects modern writing as well. Those moments, it, it comes like a psalm almost, you know, like the pointing in a psalm. It also works with comedy as well. I did a workshop once on King Lear, and in the workshop happened to be one of the actresses' father, who is a stand-up comic in Scotland. And he was just amazed that the rhythm of the fool in Lear was exactly the rhythm that he used to get a, a laugh, mm -hmm. to get his payoff lines, and it's still the same. Do you know? I mean, he'd never he knew very little about Shakespeare. He just was, but he was blown out by that. If you sat there 
And if you could, while you were reading it, which is going to be very difficult, I want you to draw what you see on that wall. And should I keep in mind they're propelling it forward rather than... Don't under- worry about anything. Caught just up with the acting of yes. Them. Just, should, no, just, just say the word Catholic as you draw, Catholic. as much as you can. Say... Hmm. Just, no. No, sure, he's not in hell. He's in Arthur's bosom, if ever man went to Arthur's bosom. I made a finer end and went away. Drawing something is always a good exercise. You might construct the first house you lived in, or a building you love, something which draws out a personal response. The flowers and smile upon his finger's end. I knew there was but one way. For his nose was as sharp as a pen and babbled of green fields. I asked Blythe to draw what she could see, partly to take her mind off the pressure of making sense of the text, but also to focus her on something visual outside herself. This made her more precise and more objective. Did him, I should not think of God. I hope there was no need to trouble himself with any such thoughts yet. So I bade me lay more clothes on his feet. I put my hand into the bed and felt it. Them they were as cold as any stone. And then I felt to his knees. And so upward and upward, and all was as cold as any stone. It's death. Really? Oh. Yes. God, but, it, but you have to keep going forward, right? I mean, yes. it has to keep I mean, it's still too many doing stops. that exercise when you're reading as well. <laughs> it was brilliant because it doing that took your took the responsibility yeah. of of the emotion, and suddenly one heard how she was thinking. Mm-hmm instead of how she was feeling, really? yes, how she was moving thing. forward. It's so hard to get away from I know. Because we always, that's what's so difficult about yeah. this for me. And Kathy was saying before, no, don't. I said, I can unless I know the subtext or the emotional life of the character. I can't just see yeah. the words, but that, but you have to. But, but it, it's, it's a two-way thing. It's that thing of doing one thing and then the other and one feeding the other. I still cold. did too many stops. Yeah. It doesn't not. matter. It takes time to do this. Yeah, it takes time to just let the emotion go, mm-hmm. let the emotion take care of itself. And when you're thinking of something in retrospect, the important thing is to be exact, isn't it? Is to be precise. She's very precise. Yeah, you there. see, then my mind went back to, oh, I better get back onto the word and, and leave. I, I, it's, it's so difficult. And well, leave it, the emotion yeah, now, and it yeah, comes in don't, anyway. Don't but get worried about that. You've got to be doing both say at once. Again, what you just said. Before. Well, we, uh, sometimes it's good to just to release the emotion and just get back to being absolutely precise and exact about she's thinking back, what happened? I went there, I did this. And she's, oh. I felt up there. And I just do it again. Because it's, it's so lovely. And don't don't be put off by that. Don't try for anything. Mm. Just do it. No, sure, he's not in hell. He's in Arthur's bosom, if ever man went to Arthur's bosom. <laughs> I made a finer end and went away, and it had been any Christum child. I parted even just between twelve and one, even at the turning of the tide. For after I saw... Just, just don't want, that's great. Just don't want, Just take a little bit more space between each thought. Okay. It'll, it'll be helpful. Nay, sure, he's not in hell. He's in Arthur's bosom, if ever man went to Arthur's bosom. I made a finer end and went away, and it had been any Christum child. I parted even just between twelve and one even at the turning of the tide. Mm-hmm. For after I saw him fumble with the sheets and play with flowers and smile upon his fingers end, I knew there was but one way, for his nose was as sharp as a pen and a babbled of green fields. 
How now, Sir John, quoth I? What man, be of good cheer. So I cried out, God, 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 three or four times. Hmm. Now I to comfort him bid him I should not think of God. Hmm. I hope there was no need to trouble himself with any such thoughts yet. So oh, I bade me lay more clothes on his feet. I put my hand into the bed and felt them, and they were as cold as any stone. Then I felt to his knees, and so upward and upward, and all was as cold as any stone. Oh, brilliant, yes. No, can, can you feel it was, it's beginning yeah. to come together, yeah, your I, feelings I, from the beginning and that thing, you know? Yeah, it it's great. Pick up, pick up and go on its own now. Yes. It, it's hard. really lovely, and it's not to say don't have emotion, but it's just the emotion just has to mm -hmm. it is has got to come from the, you can't suppress it any longer. Do you see? Rather than start out being oh, emotional, that's a good does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. It makes it more devastating that it isn't um, emotional. If if it's when you did it that time, it was quite so sort of straight. In a way, it's much more moving because what she's saying is so personal, what mm -hmm. happened to her, that that's enough in a way. The simpler it is in, in that way, the more upsetting it is. Because people do that, don't they? If something terrible's happened to them, there's a, a kind of weird calm they have about them, mm -hmm. right? the way they describe in, in detail what happened. Exactly, yeah. 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 I mean, but also it's like a well-told mm -hmm. story, or if telling a joke, you don't want to be kind of going, you're going to be like, this is a really funny joke, it's really funny, it's really funny. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You actually, you want, yeah. it, taking, you, so when, when you read it the, 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 actually the last two times, I felt like I was you, or that I was standing next to you as you were taking mm. me through this journey, and, and therefore your pain at the end was a surprise. When people die, and somebody says, were you there? And then you start saying, yeah, and he was, and how was he? And, and somebody tells the story of how this person died. Yeah. It's generally never, oh, he was just, it's how was he? It's afterwards you know, you say, that Yeah, happened, it's afterwards. It? Yeah. And you're drawn into the, into the, to the woman because of the incidental stuff she tells you. You but have to define yeah. that, don't you, to and keep yourself sane, really. These are things really. that people can share. Yeah. I mean, everyone can, they can think, oh, he looked like that, and he said that, and it's a way in. Smile at his fingers it's end. Yeah. Mm. No. I think it's what I was thinking too strongly of character when I was beginning, thinking this well, woman's different than me, and I have to... You have Don't say that. I love the idea of his nose being as sharp as a pen. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. so vivid, and I... Yeah. I didn't understand that what that was in the beginning, but it's, you used to tell me it was because it was so cold. Yes. Is that, is that like right? crazy things that people remember yeah. about yeah. people. Yeah. But you're, oh, you know, people who have died, you, you explain them in a funny way that yeah. make you laugh almost. Mm -hmm. I remember when the Piper Alpha oil rig um, blew up in Scotland and they were talking to the guys who had survived. And, and one guy, when he was describing how he survived, the way he described it was, he said, I did a beautiful swan dive off of the shelf. And I thought, that's incredible that you're, you're running and there's the whole panic and you're running to save your life. And what you most remember is that it was a beautiful swan dive. <laughs> so imagine this guy kind of going, there's flames Fantastic. blowing up, you know, people are dying, his friends are melting in front of him and he runs to the edge and what he remembers is how beautiful his dive was. And it was just incredible. That, that, you know. that says everything, doesn't it, about where somebody is at. It's that where that, you know, where our images are at. What helped about the exercise for me is I know if I'm describing a death, which I did yesterday with Tony Goldwyn, we were both in the room when somebody died, it's such a precious, bigger than human experience, it's almost like you wouldn't dare exactly. say, and then this happened, it's, it's, you, you feel like I have to be a perfect channel for this and not interpret because it's so much bigger than I even get that I'm right. going to tell you what the room looked like, what it felt like, and you know, I wouldn't dare get in the middle of it, and that's, I think, why the simpler it was, the more it was... It's also unbearable. The, the, the way she tells a story, you you kind of get the fact that she actually misses the moment when he dies. She's getting the blankets. She said, you know, he did this, and then I did this, and then... But you kind of work out that she actually was that probably moment. picking up the blankets. It's a wonderful, awful thing that he he bade her put blankets on him, but then when she felt him, it, 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 that was the moment when he went. And that she's following death up his body. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We Which all is, miss that moment, don't we? Yeah. What is that moment when that breath stops? Mm. Very good. Thank you.
Now to another piece of prose with a quite different sound, nothing poetic or extravagant in the language, but in its understated precision, it speaks volumes. I want to continue now with this thing about prose. I, I just want you to listen to something. Come a little bit forward, and Paul is going to be Brutus, and Trellis is going to be Cassius. Actually, don't look, don't read it at the moment. Just listen and see what you hear. Hear what you see. But soft, I pray you. What, did Caesar swoon? He fell down in the marketplace and foamed at the mouth and was speechless. It's very light. He hath the falling sickness. No, Caesar hath it not. But you and I, and on his casco, we have the falling sickness. I know not what you mean by that. But I'm sure Caesar fell down. If the tag rope people did not clap him and kiss him according as he pleased and displeased them as they used to do the players in the theatre, I am no true man. But what said he when he came unto himself? Mary, before he fell down, when he perceived the common head was glad he refused the crown, he plucked me up his doublet and offered them his throat to cut. And I had been a man of any occupation if I would not have taken him at a word, I would, I might go to hell among these rogues. And so he fell. When he came to himself again, he said, if, he said, if he had done or said anything amiss, he desired their worships to think it was his infirmity. Three or four wenches where I stood cried, alas, good soul and forgave him with all their hearts, but there's no heed to be taken of them. If Caesar had stabbed their mothers, they would have done no less. And after that, <laughs> he came thus sad away. Aye. Did Cicero say anything? Aye. He spoke Greek. <laughs> <laughs> to what effect? <clears throat> Nay, and I'll tell you that. <laughs> I'll ne'er look you at the face again. But those that understood him smiled at one another and shook their heads. But for my own part, it was Greek to me. <laughs> so I could tell you more news too. Morales and Flavius, for pulling scarfs of Caesar's images, are put to silence. I fare you well. There's, there was more foolery yet if I could remember it. Will you sup with me tonight, Casca? No, I am promised forth. Will you dine with me tomorrow? Aye, if I be alive, <laughs> and your mind hold, and your dinner worth eating. I will expect you. Do so. Farewell, both. It's oh, so loud. You know, like, it's on a tower. and it's like the boat, they're feeling each other out yeah. very subtly, kind of maneuvering around. It's sort of like it's as if they're circling one another, you know. It's like... And it's, it's the care of those words, isn't it? They become quite ominous in a way, don't they? But the humor is wonderful too, because it is the only way you survive. What? Did Caesar swoon? He. <laughs> They are down in the marketplace and formed at the mouth and, and was speechless. It's very light. He hath the falling sickness. Working around a table like this and changing chairs as the thoughts change is really good, for it tells us so much about how we are relating to the other character or characters whether we are being direct with them or evasive, what our purpose is, how close we feel to them at any given point. It somehow reveals the internal politics of the scene. Clap him and hiss him according as he pleased and displeased them, as they used to do the players in the theater. I am no true man. But what said he when he came unto himself? Mary, before he fell down, 
When he perceived the common head was glad, he refused the crown. He plucked me up his doublet and offered them his throat to cut. And I had been a man of any occupation. If I had not have taken him at a word, I would, I might go to hell among the rogues. And so he fell. And when he came to himself again, he said, if he had done or said anything amiss, he desired their worship to think it was his infirmity. Three or four wenches, where I stood, cried, Alas, good soul, and forgave him with all their hearts. But there's no heed to be taken of them. If Caesar had stabbed their mothers, they would have done no less. After that, he came thus sad away. Aye. Did Cicero say anything? Aye, he spoke Greek. What effect? Nay, and I'll tell you that. Now, I now look you in the face again. But those that understood him smiled at one another and shook their heads. But for my own part, it was Greek to me. I could tell you more news too. Morellus and Flavius, for pulling scarfs of Caesar images, are put to silence. Fare you well. There was more foolery, yet I could remember it. Will you sup with me tonight, uh, Casca? No, I'm promised forth. Will you dine with me tomorrow? Aye, if I be alive. Um, and, you, and your mind hold. And your dinner worth eating. Good. I will expect you. Do so. Very well, both. Great. Mm. What about that? It's, it's kind of suspension in the language all the time. It's, kind of yeah. just, it's like you're sitting on the fence. And yet throwing it away at the same yeah. time, isn't it? And it was almost the sense that you had three people with very clear agendas. Yes. And the, the centre of it was, um, was George, who had to take on board who was asking it. It wasn't just the question, it was who was asking him the question, what yeah. is that person's agenda? Yeah. Okay, yeah. now I can answer it. Yeah. So it wasn't only that they were being heard within their conversation, no. it was also his answers to the other people in the... And so it, it's always the spaces, isn't it, that, mm. that tell the story. It's quite useful to do it around the table, mm. you see, because it, it, you sort of find where you need to be in relation to the other person. It seems quite modern in a way. It's very modern, this, yes. Yeah. Is that the right well, way? I, got, I got from watching this at the table the fact that Casca kind of needs them too. That I, for, the, I, for the first time I saw you pursuing them. Yeah, every it was now great, yes. Yeah. When in fact yeah. I always just thought of the scene as those two yeah. going after yeah. him. When in fact they have moments where they kind of put their hands in the air and he says, oh, but wait, I do want to actually talk yeah. about this. The emotional undercurrent comes through the phrasing of it, through, through the different lengths of sentences, of phrases, and the short ones, and the spaces between them. And uh, if you invest it with too much feeling, you uh, we don't hear that. And actually the, the emotional undercurrent is in those spaces, isn't it? It's in the rhythm of it. Prose is much more difficult in a way to grasp, isn't it? Then, I mean, it, it's easy to see what is a line of poetry. It's not so apparent in uh, prose. <laughs> the next scene also shows three characters in a dangerous situation. They are followers of Richard II, and now the king has fled to Ireland, they are in danger from Bolingbroke. The underlying danger is similar to the Casca scene, and this again is manifested in the shared rhythms, but this time it is in verse. Listen to how they develop their argument, how they build their ladders of thought. We hear the tension as their rhythms quicken and the pitch gets slightly higher. It's after Gaunt has died in Richard II, and Richard II has taken over all Gaunt's property. These are three defectors, basically. 
The wind sits fair for news to go to Ireland, but none returns. For us to levy power proportionable to the enemy is all impossible. Besides, our nearness to the king in love is near the hate of those who love not the king. And that is the wavering commons. For their love lies in their purses, and whoso empties them by so much fills their hearts with deadly hate. For when the king stands generally condemned, if judgment lie in them, then so do we, because we ever have been near the king. Well, I will to refuge straight to Bristol Castle. The Earl of Wiltshire is already there. Thither will I with you. For little office will the hateful commoners perform for us, except like curse to tear us all to pieces. Will you go along with us? No. I will to Ireland to his majesty. Farewell. If hearts presages be not vain, we three here part that ne'er shall meet again. That says York thrives to beat back Bolingbroke. Alas, poor Jew, the task he undertakes is numbering sands and drinking oceans dry. Where one in, on his side fights, thousands will fly. Farewell at once, for once for all and ever. Well, we may meet again. I fear me never. It's like a chorus almost, isn't it? There's a, quite a music to it. Instead of being like the Brutus speech that we did and found the ladders of reasoning through that, just try and feel here how they progress with their reasoning. Let's all read it once together. Right. The wind, go. The wind, the wind sits, sits fair when he used to go to Ireland, but, but none returns. returns. For us, to the power proportionable to the enemy is all impossible. Besides, our nearness to the king of love is near the hate of those who are not the king. And that is the wavering commons, for their love lies in their purses, and whoso empties them by so much fills their hearts with deadly hate, wherein the king stands generally condemned. If judgment lie in them, then and so do we, because we never have been near the king. Well, I will for refuge straight to Bristol Castle. The Earl of Wiltshire is already there. Thither will I be with you, for little office will the hateful commoners perform for us, except like curse to tear us all to pieces. Will you go along with us? No. I will desire to his majesty. Farewell. If hearts presages be not vain, we three here part and ne'er shall meet again. That says York thrives to beat back Bolingbroke. Alas, poor Duke, the task he undertakes is the numbering sands and drinking ocean dry, where one on his side fights, thousands will fly. Yes. It is, isn't it? Yes. It's one voice, really, isn't yeah. it? Mm -hmm. And you've got to go with its rhythm. Yeah, it's Do you a totally feel that? different energy than the casca yeah. the scene from Caesar. It's total. It, it seems like much more the time is of the element, and they yeah. some the decisions have to be made right yeah. now at this table. Yes. They all know that they're all on the same side. They've, yes. all come, they've come together. Yes. And although you expect them maybe you ought to go off together, one fractures. I mean, it, yeah. it's a split, and maybe it's yeah. the first sign of, uh, of the king's party disintegrating. In this one, it seems that, especially the way the lines are set, that they all share the same rhythm. And that gives that unity you're talking about, and like a chamber piece. Yes. They're all working to the same end. Yes. Toby and Eleni, can you walk? at random up and down that side and you that side right. when they are between those two markers there and these two markers here you have to stop speaking so you're, you're in three the wind sits fair for news to go for ireland but none returns for us to levy power proportionable to the enemy is all impossible Besides, our nearness to the king is... Besides, 
other nearness to the king in love is near the hate of those that love not the king. That is the wavering commons, for their love lies in their purses, and whoso empties them by so much fills their hearts with deadly <clears throat> hate. Wherein the king stands generally condemned. If judgment lie in them, then so do we, because we ever have been near the king. Well, I will for refuge straight to Bristol Castle. The Earl of Wiltshire is already there. Thither will I with you. can the hateful common has performed for us except like curse to tear us all to pieces will you go along with us no i will to ireland too as much hmm. i will to ireland to his majesty farewell if hearts presages be not vain, we three here part that ne'er shall meet again. That's as York drives to beat back bowling broke. Ah, poor Duke. The task he undertakes is numbering sands and drinking oceans dry. Where once, where one on his side fights, thousands will fly. Farewell at once. For once, for all and ever. Well? We may meet again. <laughs> I fear me never. No. <laughs> that was why, yes. That was terrific. The words themselves are precious, they're dangerous. Mm. That's and right, they're not easy. They're yeah, they're not, not easy to say. Yeah. And they're very guarded. And very, you know, inquiring about each other because they don't quite know. You never know in that kind of society, you know, who is going to be with you. And that this is the area that we we quite find difficult to enter at the moment because we live in a, a fairly free society. But it is actually that thing of life and death there all the time. A while ago, you said something about that. There's no full stop till the end of the play. Yeah. And how it's in fact, it's not necessarily about stopping speaking or words it's just that the energy that you there were so many huge pauses in that scene and yet the the and vitality it of it really, never dropped yes and the I think suspense that's, was going all yeah, the time and i think you're right for the entire yes. any whatever play it is mm -hmm. that's got to stay in the air because whatever you say even if in the middle of your own uh, soliloquy you're provoking the next thought right you're waiting for that next moment and that everything you say is slightly altering things you can't take it back when they said, will you come with us? And he said, no. And then there was a really long break before he said why. And that was so kind of full of, you know, yes. were they enemies? Were they, you know, it was yeah. really, it was so full. Mm. And he it takes the responsibility away from the actors to decide what is secret and what isn't secret, yeah. what is important and what yeah. isn't important. Yeah. The thing that seemed to really inform that scene is that actually every single thing they said was dangerous. Yeah. And also you saw a camaraderie between them because they were protecting each other's words. So that, you know, even yes. if somebody was speaking and they, they didn't yes. see the person go past, the yes. other person would go... Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and, and yeah. looking after each other. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And they were so dependent on, on these two men over mm -hmm. here um, that they couldn't decide what moment in the piece they were going to hit because it was all up mm -hmm. in the air. You can't decide. And, you know, I mean, as actors, you have to decide at some point, but it's still, you've got to leave things open as well, haven't you? Yeah, you decide after you've explored. Yeah. So often you decide before you've gotten a chance to explore exactly. what the possibilities are. You have to make decisions about, mm -hmm. you know, the whole part before mm -hmm. you even... It's so good when there's, a, there's an element in it which you can't predict. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Because, that is, be, I mean, because it's in verse, you yes. know, things can get kind of Exactly, yes. There's, a, there's an element that you think you're not sure what's going to happen yes. next, and everything, everything stays 
Somehow we've got to always keep that anarchy yeah, open, yeah. haven't we? That subversiveness <laughs> open. I mean, because all the language is subversive in a way, isn't it? Oh, yeah. It sort of erupts all the time. <laughs> Now to another scene where there is also a shared rhythm, but for a totally different reason. The two characters are deeply in love. They share their feeling as they share their verse, their language. What we're hearing is how, in a way, the phrasing and the length of phrasing and the rhythm of it leads us into a a, a character and a, a, the character of the scene as well as, the, as your in individual characters. So now let's listen to Hermia and Lysander. And just listen, it's, it's very poetic, obviously, heightened poetry. How now, my love, why is your cheek so pale? How chance the roses there do fade so fast? The like for want of rain, which I could well beteem them from the tempest of my eyes. I am me. For aught that I could ever read, could ever hear, by tale or history, the course of true love never did run smooth. But either it was different in blood. Oh, cross, too high to be enthralled to low. Or else misgraft in respect oh, of years. Spite, too old to be engaged to young. Or else it stood upon the choice of friends. Oh, hell, to choose love by another's eyes. Or if there were a sympathy in choice, war. Death, sickness, did lay siege to it, making it momentary as a sound, swift as a shadow, short as any dream, brief as the lightning and the collied night, that in a spleen unfolds both heaven and earth, and ere a man hath power to say, Behold, the jaws of darkness do devour it up. So quick, bright things come to confusion. If then true lovers have been ever crossed, it stands as an edict in destiny. Then let us teach our trial patience, because it is a customary cross, as due to love as thoughts and dreams and sighs, wishes and tears, poor fancies, followers. A good persuasion. Therefore, hear me, Hermia. If thou lovest me, then steal forth thy father's house tomorrow night, and in the wood, a league without the town, where I did meet thee once with Helena to do observance to a morn of May. There will I stay for thee. My good Lysander, I swear to thee by Cupid's strongest bow, by his best arrow with the golden head, by the simplicity of Venus' doves, by that which knitteth souls and prospers loves, and <laughs> by that fire which burned the Carthage queen when the false Trojan under sail was seen, by all the vows that ever men have broke, a number more than ever women spoke. <laughs> In that same place thou hast appointed me, tomorrow truly will I meet with thee. Keep promise, love. Look, here comes Helena. I, I, do I totally uh, uh, contradict? What she's, is she saying, yes, I see, we should be patient? And I say, yeah, good idea. Let's get the hell out of here. Yes. Is that what happens? Yes, yes. But that's is he what just happens not listening you, yeah. to her? Or does he... Well, that's what happens in love, isn't it? I mean, yes. <laughs> oh, great, a good persuasion. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's just, he doesn't even... I guess through me is the I, me, then. I would like you to say the last two or three words of the line that has already been said to you. Okay. Um, so you might say, fade so fast, and then the light for want of rain, and then you might say, tempest of my eyes. Okay. So we hear how the argument goes. Okay. How now, my love? Why is your cheek so pale? How chance the roses there do fade so fast? Fade so fast. The like for want of rain which I could well beteem them from the tempest of my eyes. The tempest of my eyes. <laughs> I me. <laughs> for aught that I could ever read, could ever hear by tale or history, the course of true love never did run so much. But either it was different in blood. Different in blood. This exercise can be done with any piece of dialogue to find its essential rhythm and movement. When I talk about the music, what I really mean is that they take on each other's rhythm and respond to the other person's note and lift it as the thought develops and becomes emotionally heightened and as they become closer. Or if there were a sympathy, 
in choice. War, death, or sickness did lay siege to it, making it momentary as a sound, swift as a shadow, short as any dream, brief as the lightning and the collied night that in a spleen unfolds both heaven and earth, and ere a man hath power to say, behold the jaws of darkness to devour them. So quick, bright things come to confusion. Bright things come to confusion. If then true lovers have been ever crossed, it stands as an edict in destiny. Then let us teach our trial patience, because it is a customary cross, as due to love as thoughts and dreams and sighs, wishes and tears, poor fancies followers. Fancies followers. A good persuasion. Therefore, hear me, Hermie. I have a widow aunt, a dowager, of great revenue, and she hath no child. <laughs> From Athens is her house remote seven leagues, and she respects me as her only son. There, gentle Hermia, may I marry thee, and to that place the sharp Athenian law cannot mm -hmm. pursue us. If thou lovest me, then steal forth thy father's house tomorrow night, and in a wood in the wood, a league without the town, where I did meet thee once with Helena to do observance to a morn in May. There will I stay for thee. There will I stay for thee. My good Lysander, I swear to thee by Cupid's strongest bow, by his best arrow with the golden head, by the simplicity of Venus' doves, by that which knit the souls and prospers loves, and by that fire which burned the Carthage queen when the false Trojan under sail was seen, by all the vows that ever men have broke a number more than ever woman spoke. In that same place thou hast appointed me. Tomorrow truly will I meet with thee. Meet with thee? Ha, keep promise, love. Uh, look, here comes Helen. <laughs> <laughs> what about that? Wonderful. Uh, it's a little yeah. diving board. Like, where, where yes. exactly am I going from? Of course it is. It's, it's so, it's like mm -hmm. the most, it's the most moronic part of what, I, of my, of being an actor for me, but forgetting that I'm listening to the other person. Right, right. Like, I mean, it's the oldest problem yeah. in the book of like, what's my next line, as opposed to, what is she saying to me? Right. But it's also being able to hear that and yeah. really reply to that. And it, was it was amazing. It was interesting to, to realize how the my first line was so directly related to his last one, <laughs> whether I was agreeing with it or, or not. Yes. But it just it motivated me yeah. to, to really... And it gives it a different energy all the time, doesn't mm. it? Mm -hmm. I also love how she just goes off on, like, Cupid and Venus and mm -hmm. Troy and Carthage, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking, I don't give a shit about any of that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, 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 like, so factual. I'm like, yes. look, there's this private wife, they have this aunt, she has money, she has no kids, we can yes. go to this house. And she yes. starts going off on, yes. you know, <laughs> Venus and the Carthage queens. <laughs> I have a widow aunt a dowager of great revenue, and she hath no child. From Athens is her house remote, seven leagues, and she respects me as her only son. There, gentle Hermia, may I marry thee, and to that place the sharp Athenian law cannot pursue us. If thou lovest me, then, steal forth thy father's house tomorrow night, and in the wood, a uh, league without the town where I did meet thee once with Helena to do a observance to a morn in May. There will I stay for thee. My good Lysander, I swear to thee by Cupid's strongest bow, by his best arrow with the golden head, by the simplicity of Venus's doves, by that which knitteth souls and prospers love, and by that fire which burned the Carthage queen when the false Trojan under sail was seen, by all the vows that ever men have broke, a number more than ever woman spoke. In that same place thou hast appointed me, tomorrow truly will I meet with thee. Keep promise, love. <laughs> Look, here comes Helena. <laughs> Godspeed, fair Helena, whither away? Call you, me, fair. That fair again on slave. <clears throat> Demetrius loves your fair. Oh, happy fair. Your eyes are load stars. And your tongue's sweet air more tunable than lark to shepherd's ear. When wheat is green, when hawthorn buds appear. Sickness is catching. Oh, a favour so. Yours would I catch, fair Helena, er, er, Hermia, ere I go. My ear should catch your ear. 
my uh, voice, my eye, your eye. My tongue should catch your tongue's sweet melody. Were the world mine, Demetrius being baited. The rest I give to you to be translated. <sighs> Teach me how you look. And with what art, you sway the motion of Demetrius's heart. I frown upon him, yet he loves me still. But your frowns would teach my smiles much skill. I give him curses, yet he gives me love. Oh, that my prayers could your affection move. The more I hate, the more he follows me. The more I love, the more he hated His me. His folly, Helena, is no fault of mine. None but your beauty would that fault were mine. <laughs> Take comfort, he no more shall see my face. Lysander and myself will fly this place. Before the time I did Lysander see seemed Athens as a paradise to me. Oh, then what graces in my love do dwell that he hath turned a heaven unto a hell. The music is beginning to come. I know we would have to work on it. It does feel like as soon as she comes, it's there like, boom. Yeah. And, and it I happens just... in the sound of it, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. started out, they see, they, they, you had such different rhythms. It was like you were playing this note, she was playing this note, and then by the time he started to talk about the aunt, you set another pace and she caught right into it. And it was like, then it was the same note. It was like both of them went, to, went, yeah. went together. It's interesting because exactly. in the play, it's just when, you know, Hermia's getting interested in guys and Helena's getting interested in guys and he's yeah. getting interested in girls. So there's this, this conflict between the two of them. Yeah. She's really close to him, but also really close to her. And their friendship is under jeopardy because of guys, suddenly, you know. It's such a timeless thing that, you know, you're in love, your girlfriend comes, yeah. anyway. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's so modern and so familiar. Yeah. It's and suddenly the guy's gone. You can hear how the music of the scene lifts through, can't you? Mm. That it's not, you know, one uh, speech and then another speech and answering it and come to it. It's actually always going on and it's lifting it through in a way, lifting the sense through. So it keeps the suspense and that keeps the music going. And that's what interests us. And this is what is difficult now because we we tend we don't hear that so much in our heads, do we? It isn't quite so much there. I know for me, when I have a definite thing I'm trying to make clear, I, speeches can go on for pages and I'll be fine. Yeah. But in general, you're right. There, the words they use so many words that until you're you've really absolutely, gotten specific yes, with them, absolutely, I tend to not know yeah, what to do with my yeah. hands. Now, can we just go to Helena's speech instead of doing a dialogue like we did? in the same way as with some of the others, can you just do one line each, but keep uh, keep it going, you know, keep the whole thing going, answering, as it were, your thoughts? How happy some or other some can be. Through Athens I am thought as fair as she. But what of that? Demetrius thinks not so. He will not know what all but he do know. And as he errs, doting on Hermia's eyes. So I, admiring of his qualities. This is one soliloquy, but I want two people to read it to bring out the debate going on in Helena's head. She has to work through her dilemma and come to some decision as to what to do. This is important in any soliloquy. How do we think and when do we make up our minds? Wings and no eyes figure unheedy haste. And therefore is love said to be a child, because in choice he is so oft beguiled. As waggish boys themselves in game forswear. So the boy love is perjured everywhere. For ere Demetrius looked on Hermia's eye, he hailed down oaths that he was only mine. And when this hail some heat from Hermia fell, so he dissolved and showers of oaths did melt. <laughs> <laughs> I will go tell him of fair Hermia's flight. And to the wood will he tomorrow night pursue her. And for this intelligence... If I have thanks, it is a dear expense. But herein mean I to enrich my pain. To have his sight thither and back again. It's quite interesting. <laughs> but she's so lonely that now she's not lonely. <laughs> they become such good friends to each other. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think she gets bitter. No. I didn't feel bitter. I felt, I felt an over-romanticizing. You know, she's been hurt, but then 
you can't help but still like the person. It's like as long as she can keep following him, she'll be yes. fine. <laughs> yes. As long as she can scale some yes. mountain and keep pursuing yes. him, she's already yes. breathing. There is something so full of life about the, her that she's, you know, I mean, intoxicated, really. The end of each thought does really lead to the next yeah. thought. I mean, unheedy haste, the next thought is about a child, a yeah. hasty mm. child. Uh, beguiled, the next thought is about yeah. uh, a child and then game, and then game leads to perjured, and perjured leads to he promised me, and mm. promised me leads to the mm. oaths melt, and each mm. one does really... Mm. Yeah. Mm. Would you like each to do it once yourself? Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. Good <laughs> uh, move around the circle behind us. How happy some or other some can be. Kathy is moving around with her thoughts so that she can discover where they are taking her. Where is her mind going? This will take the last exercise we did a stage further. He will not know what all but he do know. And as he errs, doting on Hermia's eyes, so I, admiring of his qualities, things base and vile, holding no quantity. Love can transpose to form and dignity. Love looks not with the eyes, but with the mind. And therefore is winged Cupid painted blind. <laughs> Nor hath love's mind of any judgment, taste, wings, and no eyes figure unheedy haste. And therefore is love said to be a child, because in choice he is so oft beguiled, as waggish boys themselves in game forswear. So the boy love is perjured everywhere. For ere Demetrius looked on Hermia's eyn, he hailed down oaths that he was only mine. And when this heat, so, and when this hail, some heat from Hermia felt, so he dissolved, and showers of oaths did melt. I will go tell him of the Hermia's flight. Mm -hmm. Then to the wood will he tomorrow night pursue her. And for this intelligence, if I have thanks, it is a dear expense. But herein mean I to enrich my pain, to have his sight thither and back again. Yeah, great, the argument is really coming. <clears throat> now, what I'd like with you is that you differentiate between what is happening now and what the almost metaphysical idea of things about qualities and quantities, when you get philosophical about it. So move between those two. You can also do it behind. It's rather nice doing that behind. But just know when you're going from how happy, which is the present, as mm -hmm. it were, and through Athens, right, all those things. Until she's philosophizing. And then when she starts to philosophize, come into the center. OK. That'd be rather nice. Okay. <clears throat> <clears throat> this is your kind of inner life in here. How happy some or other some can be. Through Athens I am thought as fair as she. But what of that? Demetrius thinks not so. He will not know what all but he do know. And as he errs doting on Hermia's eyes, so I admiring of his qualities. Things base and vile, holding no quantity, love can transpose to form and dignity. Love looks not with the eyes, but with the mind, and therefore is winged Cupid painted blind. Mm. Nor hath love's mind of any judgment taste, wings and no eyes figure unheedy haste. And therefore is love said to be a child, 
Because in choice he is so oft beguiled, as waggish boys in game themselves forswear, so the boy love is perjured everywhere. For ere Demetrius looked on Hermia's eyne, he hailed down oaths that he was only mine. And when this hail some heat from Hermia felt, so he dissolved and showers of oaths did melt. <laughs> I will go tell him of fair Hermia's flight. Then to the wood will he tomorrow night pursue her. And for this intelligence, if I have thanks, it is a dear expense. But herein mean I to enrich my pain, to have his sight thither and back again. <laughs> yes. So all those things are happening in there, aren't they? All those things about time, which you have, which Lysander had, you know, the brief lightning in the college night and everything. It's also making us think about ourselves in relation to, you know, the universe. It helps it? you own it, because I know working on it, you think, oh, here comes the part where I'm an expert on something suddenly. <laughs> but if you go, all right, actually, now I'm an expert on this one horrible part of life. Yes. You own it, sort yes. of. Yes. It makes it a little better. Do you know what I mean? So it's, always, it's about imagination part. and what we do and how we, you know, and everybody's imagination is just amazing, isn't it? We right. can't ever enter into anybody else's. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel that. I felt I was at the mercy of it that love, this thing, mm. thing that I was in, was, you know, I, I was there all the way you played it. That That's so funny. Because yeah. I felt like, okay, I'm, I'm an older. expert on this one horrible thing. <laughs> 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 That's so, that, that's what makes it... You're going to get him back. <laughs> 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 Every speech in Shakespeare is about the present, about action, but it is constantly being fed by the character's own inner world. Listen now to this speech of Lady Macbeth. She has just heard the news that Duncan, the king, is coming to stay in the castle. The raven himself is hoarse that croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements. Come. You spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here, and fill me from the crown to the toe top full of direst cruelty. Make thick my blood. Stop up the images she uses tell us exactly where she is, deep inside herself. All the images are of her body. How the words she uses empower her purpose. Come to my woman's breasts and take my milk for gall, you murdering ministers. Wherever in your sightless substances you wait on nature's mischief. Come, thick night, and pall thee in the dunnest smoke of hell, that my keen knife see not the wound it makes, nor heaven peep through the blanket of the dark to cry, hold, hold. <laughs> what do you get from that? There's no downtime. <laughs> there is no downtime, is there? Yes. It kind of feeds itself, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I was so frightened of doing this speech because I've never played this character, nor have I ever played mm -hmm. anything quite like her. And the first time I read it, and I thought oh, I'll just stay with that, is she's trying to get to grab the courage, and mm -hmm. she's. She knows, I mean, she's yeah. so ambitious and she so wants these things for her and yeah. for her husband. But the, the, it was astonishing to me because I just read it for the sense of it the first time, just to myself at home. And I thought, man, she she doesn't have all this courage. She doesn't know if she has it all, yeah. you know? Yeah. She's... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I used to where are these images coming from? What the images? Yes. I didn't get the image. I got that you were so clear and really? that you knew where you were going. Oh, my Grim you knew who to yeah. yeah, you knew who to go and ask yeah. and you knew exactly <laughs> what to ask for. <laughs> no, <really. laughs> okay. I'll go with that. All right. Okay. The other thing is is it seems that there's so many one syllable words yeah. in this. Yes. I don't know why it's my blood. And yes. there's so 
the consonants are so stark, yeah. you know, and and it's so we got unlike. all that, didn't we? I mean, yeah. we really, yeah. really, yeah. we got that actual form and how it really took <clears throat> us without it being like you know well spoken, as mm. it were. Do you right. Know what I mean, mm. what I'd like us to, what I'd like you to, if you can, while still reading it, <coughs> sure. I'd like us to get some stuff in the, like boxes and things in the middle. What I want her to do is build like an altar. Hmm. The raven himself is horse that croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements. Come, you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts. Unsex me here. Fill me from the crown to the toe top full of direst cruelty. Make thick my blood. Stop up the access and passage to remorse that no compunctious visitings of nature shake my fell purpose. nor keep peace between the effect and it. Come. No. Come to my woman's breasts and take my milk for gall, you murdering ministers. Wherever in your sightless substances you wait on nature's mischief. Come thick night and pull thee in the dunnest smoke of hell that my keen knife sees not the wound it makes, nor heaven peep through the blanket of the dark to cry, hold, hold. Couldn't figure out a way to keep his chair up there. <laughs> Hello. I thought I'd just hold, hold it. <laughs> that was really good that you could. You were sort of taken off guard and didn't know what to do. She was stuck in the work. Yeah. The tower is so Yes. 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 This speech is about ambition building towards some sort of ideal. And I wanted Kate to build an altar because while she was building it and improvising it, she was also searching for things to build it with. And when you're speaking those words, you are also searching for the words to express the thought. The ambition grows as the structure grows. Now you can use variations on this exercise for other purposes, other passions. You can build an altar to love, to hate, to despair, to joy. This scene from Macbeth, it's center scene, I think. He has done the deed and is shocked by what he has done. Lady Macbeth has to revive his ambition and resolve. Their complicity and guilt are so apparent in their shared rhythms, their shared lines. I am afraid they have awaked and is not done. The attempt and that the deed confirms us. Mark, I laid their daggers ready. He could not miss them. Had he not resembled my father as he slept, I had done it. My husband. I've done the deed. It's not hear a noise. I heard the owl scream and the crickets cry. Did not you speak? When? Now. As I descend. I. Hawk. Who lies in the second chamber? Donald Bay. This is a sorry sight. A foolish thing to say a sorry sight. As one did laugh in sleep and one cried murder. They did wake each other. I stood and saw them. They did say their prayers and address them again to sleep. There are two lodged together. One cried, God bless us. And all men the other. 
as they'd seen me with these hangman's hands. Listening their fear, I could not say amen when they did say God bless it. Consider it not so deep. But wherefore could I not pronounce amen? I had most need of blessing, but our men stuck in my throat. These deeds must not be thought after these ways, so it will make us mad. Lord, I heard a voice cry, sleep no more. Macbeth does murder sleep. The innocent sleep. Sleep that knits up the raveled sleeve of care. Death of each day's life, sore labor's bath, balm of hurt minds, great nature's second course, chief nourisher in life's feast. What do you mean? Still it cried, sleep no more to all the house. Glamis hath murdered sleep, and therefore Cordor shall sleep no more. Macbeth shall sleep no more. Who was it that thus cried? Worthy fame, you do unbend your noble strength to think so brain sickly of things. Go get some water and wash this filthy witness from your hand. Why did you bring these daggers from the place? They must lie there. Go carry them and smear the sleepy grooms with blood. I'll go no more. I'm afraid to think on what I've done. Look on again, I dare not. Give them on purpose. Give me the daggers. The sleeping and the dead but are as pictures. It is the eye of childhood that fears a painted devil. If he do bleed, I'll gild the faces of the grooms with all, for it must seem their guilt. My initial instinct on in reading this yeah. was, he says, you know, there's one that did laugh in sleep, and the other cried murder. I was sort of like to go, Christ, this this happened, and you know, do you? Mm. But actually, he he's so detailed in what he says. Absolutely. It's like he's in a kind of shock. Yes, it's absolutely on the line, isn't it? What we've got mm. to do, where where we're going. He is in shock, and and she just has to keep him together. That we heard very well. Mm. Now get at a distance, so that maybe is it all right if. Toby goes up there, and you're um, just behind here, so that you're it's over a distance for the moment. Alack, I am afraid they have awaked, and tis not done. The attempt, and not the deed, confounds us. Hark! I laid their daggers ready. He could not miss them. Had he not resembled my father as he slept, I had done. I've done the deed. Didst thou not hear the noise? I heard the owl scream and the crickets cry. Did not you speak? When? Now. As I descended. I. Hark! Who lies in the second chamber? Donald Bain. This is a sorry sight. A foolish thing to say a sorry sight. There's one day laugh in sleep. The other cried murder. They did wake each other. I stood and saw them. They did say their prayers and address them again to sleep. They are too large together. One cried, God bless us. And all men the other. So they had seen me with these hangman's hands. Listening their fear, I could not say amen when they did say God bless us. Consider it not so dear. But wherefore could I not pronounce amen? I had most need of blessing, but amen stuck in my throat. These deeds must not be thought after these ways, so it will make us mad. I thought I heard a voice cry, sleep no more. Macbeth has murdered sleep. <coughs> Innocent sleep. Sleep that knits up the raveled sleeve of care. Death of each day's life. Sore labor's bath. Balm of hurt minds. Great nature's second course. Chief nourisher in life's feast. What do you mean? Still it cried, sleep no more. Glamis hath murdered sleep. 
If all Cawdor shall sleep no more, Macbeth shall sleep no more. Who was it that thus cried? I want them to feel the need to get together. They are desperately drawn. Shared rhythm, shared imagery, speaking as one voice. Wash this filthy witness from your hand. Why did you bring the daggers from the place? They must lie there. Go carry them and smear the sleepy grooms with blood. I'll go no more. I'm afraid to think of what I've done. You can't again, I dare not. Confirm our purpose. Give me the daggers. The sleeping and the dead are but as pictures. Tis the eye of childhood that fears a painted devil. If he do bleed, I'll gild the faces of the grooms withal, for it must seem his guilt. <laughs> Now I want us to look at ways of informing dialogue, of experimenting with it, of opening it up. In this scene in King Lear, Lear has come to Gloucester's castle to find his loyal Kent in the stocks. Lear has his hundred knights with him. His daughters Goneril and Regan are also there. He begs each of them in turn to give him refuge. Art not ashamed to look, to look upon this beard? Oh, Reagan, will you take her by the hand? Why not by the hand, sir? How have I offended? All's not offence that indiscretion finds and dotage terms so. Oh, sides, you're too tough. Will you yet hold? How came my man at the stocks? I set him there, sir. But his own disorders deserved much less advancement. You? Did you? I pray you, father, being weak, seem so. If till the expiration of your month you will return and sojourn with my sister, dismissing half your train, come then to me. I am now from home and out of that provision which shall be needful for your entertainment. Return to her and fifty men dismissed. <laughs> no, rather I abjure all roofs and choose to wage against the enmity of the air. To be a comrade with the wolf and owl. Necessity is a sharp pinch. Return with her? Why, the hot blooded France that dourless took our youngest born, I could as well be brought to knee his throne and squirrel like Pension begged to keep base life afoot. Return with her? Persuade me rather to be a slave and sumpter to this detested groom. At your choice, sir. My pretty daughter, do not make me mad. I will not trouble thee, my child. Farewell. We'll no more meet, no more see one another. But yet thou art my flesh, my blood, my daughter. Or rather, a disease that's in my flesh, which I must needs call mine. Thou art a boil, a plague sore, or embossed carbuncle in my corrupted blood. But I'll not chide thee. <laughs> <laughs> Let shame come when it will, I do not call it. I do not bid the thunder-bearer shoot, nor tell tales of thee to high-judging Jove. Men, when thou canst, be better at, at thy leisure. I can be patient. I can stay with Reagan. I and my hundred knights. <laughs> <laughs> not altogether so. I looked not for you yet, nor am provided for your fit welcome. Give ear, sir, to my sister, for those that mingle reason with your passion must be content to think you old, and so... But she knows what she does. Let's do something on that now, because I want to keep that for a minute. What I want to ask Gonor and Regan to do is find something. I want you to make, to get him to lie down and make him comfortable. And then you find sort of a piece of cloth or something, other pieces of cloth or cushions or something. Art not ashamed to look upon this beard? Megan, will you take her by the hand? Why not by the hand, sir? How have I offended? All's not offence that indiscretion finds and dotage terms so. Oh. Besides, you are too tough. 
Will you yet hold? How came my man in the stocks? I set him there. Sometimes it is really instructive to do an exercise which seems to go against and contradict the motive and action in the text. It releases all sorts of ambiguities. Goneril and Regan here are trying to persuade their father to dismiss his followers. They cannot put up with his hundred knights, but in so doing, they are disempowering him, taking his identity away. So I have asked Kathy and Lolita to make Samuel comfortable and undress him gently. Return to her and 50 men dismissed. No, no, rather I abjure all roofs and choose to wage against the enmity of the air, to be a comrade with the wolf and the owl. Necessity is a sharp pinch. Return with her. Why, the hot-blooded France that Dowerless took our youngest born, I could as well be brought to knee his throne and squirrel like pension bake to keep base life afoot. Return with her. Persuade me rather to be slave and sumpter to, to, to this detested groom. At your choice, sir. I prithee, daughter, do not make me mad. I will not trouble thee, my child. Farewell. We'll no more meet, no more see one another. But yet thou art my flesh and blood, my daughter. Or rather a disease that's in my flesh, which I must needs call mine. Thou art a boil, a plague sore, uh, an embossed carbuncle in my corrupted blood. But I'll not chide thee. Let shame come when it will, I do not call it. I do not bid the thunder bearer shoot nor tell tales of thee to high judging Jove. Mend when thou canst be better at thy leisure. I can be patient. I can stay with Regan. I and my hundred knights. Uh, not altogether so. I looked not for you yet, nor am provided for your fit welcome. Give ear, sir, to my sister. For those that mingle reason with your passion must be content to think you old and so... Well, but she knows what she does. It is well spoken. I dare <laughs> avouch it, sir. What, 50 followers? Is it not well? Should you need of more? Yea, or so many sit about charge and danger speak against so great a number? How in one house should many people under two commands hold amity? <laughs> it is hard! <laughs> Almost oh. impossible. Why might not you, my lord, receive attendance from those that she calls servants? Uh, or from mine. Why not, my lord? If then they chance to slack you, we could control them. If you will come to me, for now I spy a danger. I entreat you to bring but five and twenty. To no more will I give place or notice. I gave you all. And in good time you gave it. Made you my guardians, my <clears throat> depositaries. But but kept a reservation to be followed with such a number. What, must I come to you with five and twenty? Reagan said you so? Rest again, my lord, no more with me. These wicked creatures, creatures yet do look well favored when others are more wicked, not being the worst, stands in some rank of praise. I'll go with thee, yet, no, I'll go with thee, yet double five and twenty, and, and, and thou art twice her look. Uh, hear me, my lord. What need you five and twenty, ten or five, to follow in a house where twice so many have a command to tend you? What need one? A reason not the need! <laughs> Our basest beggars are in the poorest thing superfluous. 
allow not nature what nature needs. If only to go warm were gorge. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, what nature needs. Man's life is cheap as beasts. Thou art a lady. If only to go warm were gorgeous, why nature needs not what gorgeous wears would scarcely keep me warm. But for true need, <laughs> heavens, give me patience. Patience I need. You see me here, you gods, a poor man as full of grief as age, wretched in both. If it be you that stirs these daughters' hearts against these fathers, fool me not so much to bear it tamely. Touch me with noble anger, and let not woman's weapons water drop stain my man's cheeks. No, you unnatural hags! <laughs> I will have such revenges on you both that, that all the world shall... I will do such things I know not. Uh, what they are yet, yet I know not, but they shall be terrors of the earth. You, 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 you think I'll weep? I'll not weep. I have full course of weeping, but this heart shall break into a hundred thousand flaws ere I'll weep. Oh, fool, I shall go mad. <laughs> They're taking his identity away, aren't they, all the time? At first, he was so easy to get down. <laughs> it was like he did everything yeah. we wanted him to do. Yeah. <laughs> he resisted. Yeah. <laughs> did he? And uh, I thought of spitting at him Great. to get him to stop. Yeah. We don't use violence in England, do we? But I did. Yeah. <laughs> the image of putting oh. him in bed is, was, was really brilliant because it's like you, when you go to hospital, you're stripped yeah. of everything. Yeah. You're handed, you, you hand yourself over to these people who, 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 are, who, who do everything for you, but also order you about. And take your yourself take away, your identity, identity away. away, don't they? And I do think that's what they do. It was, and it's easy to play them as being evil. But actually, they're survivors as well. They've got to keep him yeah. down, as they will get lost, don't they? And the wonderful, you know, what deep five and twenty, what need one? I mean, that's what we—that's what we hear, isn't it? And then it—that—that's what sends him mad, is that they've tried, they've taken everything away from him. All of it. You were taking his manhood away, his name away, really. Who am I by the end, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, by asking, by what, doing what I was asking you to do. Depriving me of my away. people, my place, <laughs> taking my oh, stuff. Shoes. Yeah, you should take my stuff. Do you know what really made me laugh is that he was standing there with one sock on and one sock on. <laughs> but he becomes wild and very strong because of that. Yes. Yeah. It's also very clear that there are definitely certain exercises that are beautiful and perfect for when you first are looking at a, at a text. And this one is another one I think that is probably best when you're much more Absolutely. familiar with the script. When you, and, yes, when you don't, yes. And exactly. can just give yourself just, totally just to this. Just uh, react to what is being done. Yeah, to you. but it's beautiful. Oh, it's so much Because all these about. words are so very important. I mean, yeah, the yeah. things that he says. Oh, what a are play. Very I mean, the bottom line, the center line of this play is what is the cause of na in nature that makes these hard hearts? I mean, it's just, it tears at you. Yes. And then when, at the end, when he says, undo this button, it's amazing, isn't it? That going from one oh, thing yeah. to the other. Mm -hmm. Can we just, I am ever so anxious to uh, have here a piece of modern text. This from Edward Bond's play, Lear, an incredible play a kind of deconstruct on King Lear. Listen to how the thoughts move and to the spaces between the thoughts. The rhythm is its power. The king has been taken prisoner and he's been forced to look into a mirror by his two daughters who defeated him in battle. And he's been made to confront his identity as a mad tyrant. Yeah. 
No. That's not the king. This is a little cage of bars with an animal in it. No, that's not the king. Who shut that animal in that cage? Let it out. Have you seen its face behind the bars? There's a poor animal with blood on its head and tears running down its face. Who did that to it? Is it a bird or a horse? It's lying in the dust and its wings are broken. Who broke its wings? Who cut off its hands so that it can't shake the bars? Pressing its snout on the glass. Who shut that animal in a glass cage? Oh God, there's no pity in this world. You let it lick the blood from its hair in the corner of a cage with nowhere to hide from its tormentors. No shadow, no hole. Let that animal out of its cage. Look. Look. Have pity. Look at its claws trying to open the cage. It's dragging its broken body over the floor. You are cruel. Cruel. Look at it lying in its corner. It's shocked and cut and shaking and licking the blood on its sides. No, no. Where are they taking it now? Not out of my sight. What will they do to it? Oh, God, give it to me. Let me hold it and stroke it and wipe its blood. No! Oh, it's wonderful. The imagination tells him the truth yes. when he's using all his powers yes. to deny it yes. or to keep it down. Yes. But it rises in front of him and he's left with this tortured image, which is the truth. Yes. The part of everybody that's Absolutely. like a little yes. wounded animal, yes. which brilliant. he has spent his life denying. Yes. And which he finally sees in this, yes. when he's forced to look into the mirror, when he's defeated, yes. and he has nothing left. Andrew and I have done a few workshops with writers in the last two, three or four years. They've come and we've worked on Shakespeare with them, like people like Hal Brenton, and you know, really well established writers. They bought a piece of their work, and the actors, they sort of actors have worked on each on on the pieces. What the actors understood from it is that a writer does not think of an image and, and think of a logical thing through. An image comes to the writer from somewhere. It can be from out there, it can be from inside, from any, all sorts of places. And they hold on to that image and then something logical happens and then they put it into you know a, a form and into a story but it so often comes from an image from nowhere from something quite else and it's very it's a very good thing to hold on to because i think actors have to work that way too but you obviously have to interchange between that and then making the logical story could you just do that one if we all get up and do it one more time and you do it one more time, so we hear it. And just get round him, and maybe use us as your mirror. But in fact, we can turn away from him if he comes to us. No. That's not the king. This is a little cage of bars with an animal in it. No, no. That's not the king. Who shot that animal in that cage? Let it out. Have you seen its face behind the bars? There's a poor animal with blood on its head and tears running down its face. Who did that to it? Is it a bird or a horse? 
It's lying in the dust and its wings are broken. Who broke its wings? Who cut off its hands so that it can't shake the bars? It's pressing its snout on the glass. Who shot that animal in a glass cage? Oh, God. There's no pity in this world. You let it lick the blood from its hair in the corner of a cage with nowhere to hide from its tormentors. No shadow, no hole. Let that animal out of its cage! Look! Look! Have pity! Look at its claws trying to open the cage! It's dragging its broken body over the floor. You are cruel! Cruel! Look at it lying in its corner. It's, it's sharp and cut. And bleeding and licking the blood on its sides. No. No. Where are they taking it from? Not out of my sight. What will they do to it? Oh, God. Give it to me. Let me hold it and stroke it. And wipe its blood. No! No! Right, yeah. and the muscularity of that language. Now, it is those spaces between words, allowing them to drop in, allowing them to do that, which then feeds thought, which then feeds feeling, emotion, if you like, and that. Shall we break it down, then? That's great. Thank you. Thank you. I was talking to Edward Bond the other day. And he said something really interesting. Well, he always does. It went something like this. When you are writing, the character is breathing differently. Phrasing and everything depends on the breathing. Breathing takes priority over everything. Voice is a part of the body as much as hands or arms. The way you are breathing is what authenticates not physical effort. And it should not surprise us that the same instincts which lie behind the playwright's original thoughts are precisely what we have been working on here today with our study of the language and the structure of their speeches to find out how they inform character and character relationship. Tape 4 is a compilation of the voice work which we did at intervals throughout the workshop. It includes exercises on breathing and rooting the voice, exercises on consonant muscularity and opening the vowels, and on head and chest resonance, and the resonance throughout the body. And you see these exercises put to practical use. It really tells the background story of these videos.